Welcome to Texas Heart Institute Educational Programs, Cardiology in the Time of COVID-19, featuring today thrombotic and embolic complications. My name is Van Merkrazer. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Health, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Joining me today here is Dr. Stephanie Coulter, who's Assistant Medical Director at Texas Heart Institute and also Director uh, for Women's Heart and Vascular Institute and also Program Director of Cardiovascular uh, Fellowship uh, at our institution. Welcome, Dr. Coulter. Thank you, Dr. Kreiser. Joining us also today is our special guest, Brianna Costello. She's an International Cardiology Fellow at Texas Heart Institute here in Houston, Texas. Thank you, Dr. Crazier and Dr. Coulter for having me. You're welcome, Brianna. <clears throat> so, Dr. Crazier, please explain to us the potential effects of coronaviruses on the vascular system. Well, uh, let's start with a recent publication uh, that was published in March of uh, 2020 by our former fellow, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Majid, and the title of uh, this um, manuscript was Potential Effects of Coronaviruses on the Cardiovascular System. It was a systematic review and I believe one of the best reviews related to coronaviruses on the cardiovascular system. We can see here from his uh, publication very extensive effect of coronaviruses on cardiovascular system, particularly concentrating on the cardiac uh, system per se. One of the most important things from this information and from publications elsewhere is that coronaviruses affect the vascular system directly and produce significant degree of inflammatory process. We all know that this is done through a spike protein on coronaviruses that attaches itself to ACE2 um, site uh, and then uh, enters the cell and causes very aggressive cellular destruction. Uh, ACE2 uh, uh, sites are very uh, extensively represented throughout the vasculature in the heart and also peripheral vessels as well, but also in lung tissue and this is where most of the damages occur. We have also seen from uh, many publications and also related to Majid's publications that there are certain similarities among coronaviruses such as SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2 because both of them attack and attach itself to a uh, ACE2 receptor site. They have a very similar incubation period and also reduplication as far as infectiveness is concerned. Of course, there is a significant difference as far as mortality is concerned. While SARS uh, covirus and MERS have a significantly higher mortality, uh, SARS covirus 2 has a significantly lower mortality, but it certainly causes a lot of cardiovascular problems. The mortalities we can see is uh, for um, SARS covirus. Uh, around 10% and the MERS at 30% while SARS-CoV-2 mortality depends tremendously depending on uh, the comorbid conditions and the uh, mm. pre-risk uh, 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 of uh, certain individuals that might be more prone. We know that uh, uh, as far as ACE2 receptors are concerned, they are more prevalent in males they're more prevalent in patients with hypertension. They're somewhat less prevalent in females, somewhat less prevalent in children. And uh, we know that that certainly plays a significant role as far as mortality and morbidity of this particular virus is concerned. So as far as uh, SARS-CoV-2 risk of thrombosis in the arterial and also venous system is concerned, the mechanism is by damaging the endothelium and causing endothelial dysfunction and uh, f uh, stimulating formation of inflammatory substances such as interleukin-6 and other ones. And that 
causes reduction in the thromboplastin that leads to thrombosis. All of those factors play a significant role, not only affecting the endothelial dysfunction, but also producing cytokine in a storm, which is more prevalent in a patient that have a very uh, significant elevation of inflammatory substances, such as interleukin-6. <clears throat> Brianna, can you tell us a little bit about hypercoagulability state and how is this uh, caused and manifested on the venous side? Certainly. So um, we all know Virchow's triad of stasis of blood flow, um, endothelial or vessel wall injury, and hypercoagulability. Those are the kind of three cornerstones of um, th thrombosis, particularly in the venous side. Um, there are some arterial aspect to this too, but um, in these patients, especially the patients who already are at risk with say perhaps venous insufficiency or um, hyper you know inflammatory states at baseline um, covid adding another layer of hypercoagulability um, by disrupting the clotting cascade certainly is like a third strike um, so when you have these three aspects of you know stasis injury and hypercoagulability you're really at risk for a, a venous event um, which many of these patients have um, kind of dovetailing off of that, um, again, these patients, they're not just um, any healthy patient walking the street. Most of our patients we're seeing with coronavirus have underlying risk factors. Um, many of these are acquired, um, and we've all seen patients with advanced age or, you know, immobility. Um, but we have, there's many others that we don't often think of, such as diabetes. This is, you know, increases your risk for thrombotic events, um, both arterial and venous. Um, the other less common ones, of course, are myeloproliferative proliferative disorders um, and HIV and AIDS. But again, many patients have these other risk factors that they've acquired through their life. Um, some of the hereditary ones, which are again less common, and we, um, as cardiologists, maybe perhaps we don't see them as frequently, so we don't think about them as often. But factor V Leiden is a big, um, it's you know a very common hereditary cause for um, a thrombotic event, and these patients. I'm certain, and there's probably not been anything published on this just quite yet, correct me if I'm wrong, but patients with some factor V Leiden and coronavirus likely are at higher, of course, are at higher risk than um, a patient without factor V Leiden with coronavirus for thrombotic events. So maybe these patients are, you know, um, being overrepresented in the coronavirus thrombotic, um, you know, group. Um, but again, just a reminder, the hereditary causes factor V uh, Leiden, prothrombin, uh, 20210A. There's protein C and S deficiency. So the factors that generally help you um, declot um, if you're deficient in those, um, elevated homocysteine, and then um, there's a variation of elevated factors that can also increase your risk for clotting. Um, a couple of the more um, rare disorders, dysfibrinogenemia and antithrombin deficiency, again, are still risk factors, but less common, but things that to keep in mind in your patient who might be presenting as a clot with coronavirus. And also, uh, recently it was published that uh, 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 in the patients uh, with a coronavirus infection, uh, the um, lupus anticoagulant might be playing a significant role in this particular problem. Right. Um, and again, these, all of these things we're kind of seeing as the, the pandemic kind of progresses. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out and, and you know, what happens to these patients long term. It's interesting to me how much we've learned since we had our first COVID-19 cardiology session with Mohammed Majid and only six weeks ago and how much more we've experienced because we've taken care of these clinically difficult patients and what we've seen and how much has been added to our knowledge, even if it's on Facebook blogs or communication between physicians from New York and New Orleans and how much we're learning. So there's going to be a lot of information to come out later. Hopefully people are storing blood samples on some of these very critically ill patients so they can go back retrospectively and look at those that had prothrombotic events to look to see how many of them had factor V Leiden. Because when you're in the heat of the moment caring for these critically ill patients, you're just looking to put out the fire. You're not looking for what caused the fire. And so I'm hopeful that astute clinicians here in the States are gonna be more 
carefully investigating what are the predisposing conditions. Yeah, that would be great. All right, Dr. Crazier, so tell us, what are the fat risk factors and hemostatic abnormalities and clinical manifestations of these patients with COVID-19? Well, Brianna, you already mentioned uh, acquired factors and the genetic factors that play a significant role. And uh, I don't think it's necessary to repeat uh, all of them. I would just like to mention that acute illness of any kind is a major risk factor mm -hmm. and inactivity, which is very common, obviously, in patients uh, with uh, COVID, particularly if they're on a respirator and bedridden. And uh, you talked about the genetics, which play a significant role. Uh, what has not been mentioned to a certain degree mm -hmm. in the literature is that uh, there are a subset of patients with uh, pelvic uh, obstruction disease, such as May Turner and similar uh, other things that could be uh, related to a certain degree to it from trauma, uh, that could also lead to a hypercoagulable condition and thrombosis, including also dehydration with all those factors. And also in patients with chronic venous insufficiency and trauma to the lower extremities and previous history of thrombophlebitis. Dehydration is a major factor, I think, that plays a role in a lot of those patients but also liver failure, chronic renal failure, COPD, uh, congestive heart failure, and malignancy, as you mentioned before. There are numerous hemodynamic or hemostatic, uh, sorry, hemostatic abnormalities that occur. And uh, one of the common ones that has been found on a pathology evaluation of patients that died is uh, a frequent pulmonary microemboli and on occasion intravascular coagulopathy that affects many organs. Uh, myocardial injury is not rare, it's common. Elevated troponin is very common and myocardial injury could be due to myocardial infarction, but also it could be related to myocarditis. There are numerous inflammatory biomarkers that are very frequently present in patients with COVID, such as uh, elevated D-dimer, even without evidence of pulmonary emboli, elevated PT and activated PTT, elevated fibrin uh, degradation products and CRP are very commonly elevated. And of course, uh, elevated interleukin-6, particularly in cytokine storm, is very frequently elevated. Platelet count is uh, frequently low and uh, lymphopenia is uh, low as well as uh, decreased uh, uh, TIFP factor. And there are numerous clinical manifestations. Uh, we have talked already on our previous um, uh, webcast on uh, cardiac effects, but we are now concentrating on DVT, which is not uncommon, and pulmonary emboli, whether microemboli or uh, major uh, emboli are not also uncommon. Myocardial infarction, uh, CVA, uh, has been described more and more now, particularly in younger individuals, mm -hmm. and uh, peripheral thrombosis uh, for a variety of reasons, and the DIC has been des described uh, as a relatively common condition in patients with advanced uh, and serious condition, particularly those patients that are rapidly deteriorating and also have a cytokine storm. Now, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Coulter, uh, Stephanie, if you can uh, tell us a little bit about incidence of stroke, we just mentioned this, in this infection, and uh, what do you think is the cause of this occurrence? Well, large vessel stroke is a presenting feature of COVID-19 in the young. And in these young people about with stroke, these are people without advanced vascular disease with, you know, really low cardiovascular risk. Um, maybe as in these groups, as much as 5% of hospitalized patients. So we think it's a direct effect of the infection on the vascular endothelium associated potentially with a hypercoagulable state. We've actually seen a couple of cases here in our institution of large vessel stroke in otherwise very low risk individuals. So you have to really assume there's something intrinsic to the way that the virus um, interacts with the vascular endothelium.
You know, it's it would be interesting to see. Um, I don't know. Maybe a neurologist would know, or an, uh, you know, interventional neurologist, what the ACE two receptor concentration is in the brain. If it's higher in the brain, like it is in the lungs, I don't know if they would know that answer. Maybe that's causing more localized inflammation in those large vessels. But the other interesting thing about these young patients that present with stroke is that they're not presenting with acute, severe COVID-19 related systemic illness. They're just presenting form fruits with stroke, um, which takes out a lot of the other co-founding factors that Dr. Crazier just went through. Because certainly hypoxia in patients on ventilators, with COVID-19 in the hospital have, are, are well demonstrated to have elevation in their RV systolic pressures, which early on in the pandemic, we assumed was related to ARDS. But certainly, you know, vascular endothelial dysfunction in a patient with hypoxia related vasoconstriction, you could see where you've set up a perfect storm for microthrombi in the pulmonary vascular bed. We're seeing this on um, echocardiograms that are being obtained in these corona patients and as well as on the portable, um, what do we call it, POCUS, what do we call that? Oh, I know what it's called, po um, point of care ultrasound, where in fact some of the pre-terminal events for these patients really are when the right ventricle begins to fail, which is often associated with marked elevation of the RV systolic um, pressures. All right, thank you, Dr. Coulter. So Dr. Crazier, what have we learned from the early reports on COVID-19 effects um, on thrombosis and thrombotic risk? Well, we have learned a lot uh, in the last few months as far as uh, thrombosis is concerned, not only as far as the incidence is concerned, but also different sites and causes and uh, treatment, what works, what doesn't work. As uh, Dr. Coulter has uh, mentioned, uh, pulmonary thrombotic complications occur relatively frequently, particularly in patients that have uh, respiratory manifestations as a primary feature of this particular disease. Uh, there is obviously uh, uh, increased risk of clotting related to many different things that we have already discussed. But uh, for instance, like patients that are on CVVHD, they have high incidence of clotting. Patients that have indwelling catheters, mm -hmm. they frequently have clotted catheters and exercise for that particular reason. Uh, we have also learned that uh, in early experiences, uh, VT prophylaxis was not routinely used because we didn't realize the importance of this particular treatment. And uh, we also learned in early experiences that the VTE uh, occurred in spite of uh, prophylaxis. And that kind of alerted us that maybe we were not addressing it properly and maybe we were not using adequate uh, treatment uh, modalities and doses of those drugs. And uh, since then, we have uh, certainly learned quite a bit and adjusted the use of uh, and doses of anticoagulants and noticed some improvements. What we have also learned that uh, there is a relatively low incidence of bleeding, mm -hmm. which uh, indicates that we maybe should be more aggressively treating patients with COVID because we can avoid major complications such as bleeding. On the right hand side, you can actually see that over a period of time, as far as the infection is concerned, this uh, uh, prothrombotic effect goes up progressively, which is understandable because as the virus continues to circulate, circulate it affects more and more endothelium and causes more and more uh, prothrombotic type of occurrences and uh, it can be somewhere in the range of 33 to 35 percent of all the hospitalized uh, patients with COVID conditions. Well clearly that incidence, Dr. Crazier, exceeds what we know about the incidence of hypercoagulable states that are genetic or predestined in this in this clinical syndrome. So certainly you know, we might think there's a background of risk that may be 6% of the population, 
Um, but certainly 33% is an exorbitant risk of prothrombotic complications that seems to plateau, you know, on that, on that slide that you presented, um, suggesting that the virus itself, which goes along with viral infections in the past where certain viruses could induce a hemorrhagic um, milieu and in other viruses, obviously, um, we're seeing a prothrombotic complication. Right. All right, Dr. Coulter, so tell us about critical illness and VTE risk with VTE prophylaxis versus no VTE prophylaxis. Thank you, Brianna. We can see here on this slide that in those that have no VTE prophylaxis, the risk of developing a venous or thrombosis event um, ranges from 13 to 31 percent. But in those that are on some sort of VTE prophylaxis, the incidence is reduced to between 5 and 24 percent. But in those with COVID-19, if they're not on prophylaxis, you can see that the risk is about 25 percent or greater. And on those with prophylaxis, um, and this is just prophylaxis doses, the rates are not that much reduced, suggesting that whatever the occurrence in the cell or in the endothelial cell, we're going to have to overcome a serious resistance um, within the system and um, develop a better technique to prevent thrombosis. Yeah, and it, this probably, you know, helped, um, you know, develop as we're going to talk about um, soon the guidelines because I'm sure that most of these patients, if they were critically in the ICU, as per a normal ICU, you know, protocols were on prophylaxis. Um, but this was a stark and shocking, um, you know, event when many of these patients still developed thrombosis. So it's very, you know, interesting and unique to the coronavirus uh, 19, COVID-19. Um, so, I mean, it, um, in this, Brianna, this slide clearly shows that even with the background of like intravenous heparin, the rates of thrombosis are still quite high. And certainly yeah. there's some benefit to full dose therapeutic heparin, but certainly it doesn't completely squash the risk in these high risk patients. And it's so interesting, you know, as the biomarkers go up, you know, the D-dimer goes up, um, it's you know, almost linear how much the mortality increases in those heparin non-users. Now for you guys, I want to hear, um, as an attending, how has coronavirus 19 affected the way you care for your patients in your practice in the office? Well, Brianna, thank you very much for asking us this very, very important uh, question. And of course, uh, we're still learning and the criteria are still evolving, but uh, the International Society of Thrombosis uh, has established uh, guidelines and uh, this has been published recently in the American Journal of Cardiology uh, 2020. And uh, I personally follow those uh, guidelines. What is very important and is pertinent as far as all the information we have just discussed, first you talk to the patient if the patient has any history of a hypercoagulable state, such as a genetic or a quiet hypercoagulable state, you have to address the patient differently than those patients that have only mild or minimal symptoms. Also, the approach and treatment is different if the patient has a serious condition and has to be hospitalized versus patient that can be managed on outpatient basis. But the ISTH uh, guidelines as far as VT, prophylaxis, and monitoring concern uh, uses the uh, following criteria at the time of uh, presentation. Of course, you should obtain routinely PT, APTT, D-dimer, uh, fibrinogen levels, uh, uh, platelet count, CRP, ferritin, uh, of course, uh, uh, CBC with differential CMP. Those would be routinely obtained uh, when you see the patient, regardless of the patient's condition and the severity of the disease. Now, once you have elevated fibrinogen, and particularly if you have significantly elevated D-dimer, more than 1,000, this would indicate worse outcomes uh, and very poor prognosis. And this particular patient would require admission and very close observation. And then the question is, what is the testing frequency? How often should you repeat those um, tests to make sure that the patient condition is not deteriorating? Uh, 
Uh, it depends on the severity of disease. Uh, first, we start uh, on daily basis for hospitalized patients. And if we see that any of the parameters are rapidly deteriorating, particularly as far as D-dimer level or uh, fibrinogen level, then we do it almost on daily basis. But if uh, the condition is relatively stable or the patient is being evaluated and treated on an outpatient basis, we might do it once or twice a week. Very good. Dr. Coulter, what do you think about the thromb uh, thrombosis, prophylaxis, and treatment recommendations? I think they, they have finally come out with some um, thoughts on this. So for patients that have um, COVID-19 or that are admitted with COVID-19, the recommendations now are that all hospitalized patients should receive some pharmacologic prophylaxis according to risk stratification. So we look at the creatinine clearance and um, note that if the creatinine clearance is greater than 30 mils per minute, then we recommend um, weight adjusted um, low molecular weight heparin at full dose. And if the creatinine clearance is less than 30, then we do weight adjusted and renally adjusted um, unfractionated heparin um, to better able to watch the creatinine clearance. We recommend monitoring of the PT, the D-dimer, the fibrinogen, the platelet count, the LDH, the creatinine, and obviously the liver function tests over time. But in patients that have elevation of the D-dimer with multi-organ failure, we're recommending full dose, low molecular word heparin or unfractionated heparin. Yeah, I, I agree, Stephanie, with all of your uh, comments and uh, suggestions as far as treatment is concerned. The most frustrating scenario occurs when you have a multi-organ failure. Yeah. And when you have a patient with a renal functional impairment, which is uh, typically seen in very advanced COVID cases, and also liver uh, failure as well. And uh, some of those might also have uh, problems with risk of bleeding, gastritis, and, and so on. And then it becomes really, really complicated scenario. Uh, how to treat it and what, it, what is the best uh, option as far as treatment is concerned. Uh, from the literature, uh, there is in general uh, consensus that um, thrombolytics yeah. probably should not be used in this type of a scenario because of the high risk of uh, bleeding because uh, of all the organs that are affected with this uh, particular condition. So, Dr. Crazier, what are our current unanswered questions on COVID-19? And that's a tough question for you because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of questions we still have unanswered. It's a tough question yeah. for all of us, Stephanie, as a matter of fact. Uh, we have learned so much in the last uh, few months uh, as far as COVID pandemic and uh, all the problems that uh, are this particular infection is causing. And uh, I think that uh, there are a lot of unanswered, unanswered questions that uh, we are struggling with. Um, one of the particularly frustrating one is um, uh, for how long are patients uh, with COVID-19 infection pro-thrombotic? Uh, uh, of course, uh, we can get certain ideas by doing those tests on a regular basis, but uh, there is unknown factor, particularly in those scenarios where we see a patient has mild symptoms and then it gets better, and then in a week or two gets significantly worse symptoms and uh, develops one of the features such as myocardial infarction or CVA or thrombophlebitis or a pulmonary emboli. So those are challenging scenarios and we still don't understand why this happens and why those Patients have recurrence of symptoms and rapid deterioration. Another scenario is um, what treatment offers the best outcomes, not only related to treatment with anticoagulants, but uh, with any other drugs that are currently being used. We're still experimenting with a lot of drugs. There might be 20 or 30 clinical trials ongoing, and we still don't have all of the answers. And some of the drugs that are currently being used that show promises to a certain degree. We have an issue as far as availability is concerned mm -hmm. because we are not, they're not being produced in adequate numbers to be able to treat huge populations of patients with these conditions. Mm 
Also, another question is for how long should we use anticoagulant therapy? Typically, uh, when we have uh, either thermophlebitis, we'll do it for a relatively short period of time if there's no evidence of propagation or poor emboli, but we don't know uh, what is the optimal time to uh, use this type of a treatment in patients with uh, COVID-19. Another issue is uh, what is the effectiveness of unfractionated uh, heparin in acute inflammation and uh, uh, many other scenarios, particularly like HIT, how often does it occur in uh, patients that are on unfractionated heparin in this type of scenario? Are they more prone to HIT? Because not infrequently in patients with serious COVID uh, infection, we will get a DIC and we are not always able to differentiate. Is it partially related to HIT or it's not related to HIT? And also there are other questions. Uh, uh, what is the most effective therapy when the patient is discharged and for how long should we treat the, the patient with this particular therapy? And what is certainly not uh, known well, what is the role of DOAC post-discharge? I personally uh, treat patients after discharge with DOAC, but I am not sure if they are as effective as uh, other anticoagulants uh, like uh, anti-vitamin K type of uh, anticoagulants for patients with COVID, particularly if they still have active condition. And another question is also, what are the long-term sequelae in these patients? And we have seen now scenarios where patients recover physically to a great degree, but they have some of the CNS symptoms and uh, even uh, some uh, cognitive deterioration of their function and we don't know whether this is related to microemboli or to some other effects of COVID-19 on the CNS. I don't know, uh, Stephanie, if you have uh, some other comments or suggestions or Brianna that you might think uh, that is um, also troublesome or unanswered at the present time related to COVID-19. Well, for sure, for patients that have known clotting with DVT or PE, we still have to follow the guidelines for long-term anticoagulation, which should give them plenty of time to recover and um, gives us some background um, mitigation of risk. Um, and we should see what, that, what those patients look like over time. I'm worried, honestly, um, for those that are hospitalized for quite a long time and have recurrent events as we see, um, that these people really should be discharged with really therapeutic doses of anticoagulants. I'm a little bit more, um, as an echocardiographer, in, in the use of vitamin K antagonists, um, particularly um, for the reduction in thrombus burden and I think the efficacy of these vitamin K dependent or warfarin type agents are, are preferable to the DOACs, but I know that may be a little bit more controversial. There was an article actually recently looking at um, clot breakdown in apical thrombi in patients with um, you know, cardiomyopathy and showed that vitamin K dependent inhibition was superior to DOACs in that um, situation so yeah I, I agree, I agree with you on that comment yeah. and particularly in patients that have uh, genetic hypercoagulable states I'm not sure that dogs especially, are as effective me too especially since we don't know what the underlying etiology and because you know lupus and a coagulant has been associated with this virus certainly we know that in patients with lupus and a coagulant warfarin is the preferred agent so I think I would be more conservative and use the coagulant, the anticoagulant that hits the coagulation cascade at multiple points and not just the targeted um, sharpshooter at the end of the coagulation cascade um, targeting thrombin. Brianna, what do you think? You've seen some of these cases. Yeah, so I guess my one of my biggest questions is where when are we going to start seeing all the patients who had their end STEMI or their STEMIs at home? Because we've certainly seen a downtrend, a downtick massively in the ACS cases, especially the STEMI. And I know there are reports of this um, happening in major centers across the country, in the world. 
Um, so I'm wondering if, you know, we went back to using TPA, are we going to go back to seeing some VSDs or some, you know, free wall ruptures in these patients that we've not taken to the lab or that have had their MIs at home? Um, and then, you know, furthermore, um, is in the lung in the pulmonary side of things, these patients who recover from COVID um, who had pulmonary symptoms, um, what is this going to mean on, you know, pulmonary, for a cardiologist's perspective, on pulmonary hypertension um, after they recover? Um, so that I think we just have a, a lot more learning as much as we've done. There's going to be a lot more for us to see when this starts to get better, the pandemic. Um, so it's going to be a lot of learning for all of us, all of our, you know, specialists and internists. Well, uh, Dr. Coulter and uh, uh, Dr. Costello, I think this has been an excellent uh, presentation and discussion. And I think uh, our conclusion as far as uh, COVID-19 and thrombotic events are concerned is think about hypercoagulable states in patients with COVID-19. They are very common. They could be either caused by uh, uh, acquired conditions which is very common in those patients, particularly if they are bedridden and they have an inflammatory process and other organ involvement. But also think about uh, genetic factors that play a role, uh, look for them, and address the problem early and effectively. If there are no uh, uh, any other questions or comments, uh, we greatly appreciate your participation in this program, and thank you very much. And we'll. Uh, reconvene very soon at another COVID-19 program at Texas Heart Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Frazier and Dr. Colder for having me. Thank you.